Pompei is already a top three global cyber power alongside the US and China. So as well as the opportunities for economic growth and the wider emancipation, if you like, of the citizen that we see online, I want to talk to you today a little bit about how we will continue growing our capabilities to defend the UK's interests online and at the same time, how we're going to deliver our vision for being a leading responsible global cyber power, working with our partners to shape cyberspace according to our values. Now there's a common misconception that cyber power is all about people like Q in a bunker somewhere coming up with the gizmos of the future. But the reality in is that it's much, much broader than that. Now, we do need coders, computer scientists, if we're going to succeed. But we also need a much broader alliance of people involved, the teachers, the researchers, businessmen and women, diplomats who understand how to make the best of the diplomatic power that we've got, as well as the new technology. We need the combination of resilient defences, but also offensive capabilities, and the global diplomatic clout, which comes with being a modern cyber power. Now, here in the UK, that starts with our underlying comparative advantage in science and technology. We've got a great foundation. With less than 1% of the world's population, we've got more Nobel Prize winners than any other country outside the US, and 14% of the most cited research. We've got one in five of the world's top universities. We're home to leading medical research, including the Jenner Institute that developed the, Austria, the, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine to tackle COVID. And by the way, the Jenner Institute also led the trials on the Ebola vaccine, which was funded by UK aid. And last month, it developed a game-changing vaccine for malaria. So we're good at this, and it's not just a one-off. Now, when it comes to business growth, the UK has the most tech unicorns in Europe. We're fourth in the Global Innovation Index, produced by Cornell University, INSEAD, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. So the point I'm making is that we've got pedigree here, we've got history, and innovation runs th right the way through our DNA. And that's why, in the Integrated Review of Foreign Policy, we identified science and technology as one of this country's great strengths, something we really got to nurture and reinforce in the years ahead. It's vital for jobs and livelihoods. It's vital to the levelling up agenda right across the UK. Now, London, I think, is well known as a magnet for tech startups. But don't forget that Belfast is a world-leading cybersecurity hub too, a top international investment location for cybersecurity firms. And the tech sector is thriving right across the whole of the United Kingdom. And it's not just at home. We're, in 2019, exporting cyber products and services worth £4 billion. Just last week, we saw the successful stock market launch of Darktrace, which is a world leader in using AI to prevent cyber attacks. So UK tech creates jobs, it protects our security. But it's also helping us to be an even stronger force for good in the world. Think of the difference that mobile phone banking has made across Africa and Asia, boosting economic activity by giving millions of people access to the formal financial system, people that wouldn't otherwise have been able to finance business activities and otherwise. Now, it started back in 2003 with a research and development grant from British Aid. It supported Vodafone to launch a mobile currency service to support microfinance. And that led to banking services like M-Pesa, which is now used by over 28 million people in East Africa. But what does that mean in practice? Well, for a woman in rural Kenya, toiling to support her family through subsistence farming, M-Pesa has been a total game changer. It provides her with access to small loans and remittances from relatives. That's important because it gives her access to capital, and that allows her to set up a business, whether it's a small kiosk or something that can scale up to something even bigger. And that gives her and her family a ladder out of poverty. Just in terms of the scale of what that means, in Kenya alone, mobile money has helped around 185,000 women make that kind of transition. So my starting point in this whole debate is that UK tech is a massive, massive force for good. But I do think we need to acknowledge there is a darker side. And the integrated review highlighted the increasingly competitive world in which we live and the clash of values that is playing out today between countries that want to protect and preserve a system based on open and outward-looking societies and those, on the other hand, who are promoting an authoritarian international system. And we can see this clash between authoritarian and democratic states playing out very directly right now in cyberspace. 
You've got authoritarian regimes like North Korea, Iran, Russia, China, who use digital tech to sabotage and to steal, or to control and censor. And perhaps we saw that most ruthlessly recently when the military junta shut down the internet in Myanmar. So how do we safeguard our vision of a free, open, peaceful and secure cyberspace? One which emancipates the citizen through this world of new online opportunities, but at the same time strives to protect them online from the predators, whether they're paedophiles, criminal gangs or hostile states. Well, first, I think it's really important to understand the full spectrum of the threats that we face. Let me just give you a flavour of the kinds of malicious and dangerous activity that's happening all the time, although often it's out of the public's view. Just this weekend, the largest pipeline in the United States was knocked out by a criminal gang in the latest ransomware attack. Now that pipeline, which runs from Texas to New York, transporting gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, provides 45% of the supply to the US East Coast. So an outage like that threatens price spikes, shortages, very severe economic disruption. Then again, in March this year, Microsoft reported a cyber attack on the Microsoft Exchange server by a state-sponsored group operating out of China. Now, the early indications, as best as we can glean them, are that at least 30,000 organizations were compromised in the US, around 3,000 in the UK, right the way from businesses to individual citizens. And of course, these attacks can have global impacts well beyond their initial specific target. So in 2017, the Russian military mounted the NotPetya cyber attack on Ukraine. And now that was intended very specifically to hit the country's banks, its government, its energy companies. But the impact rapidly spread from New Jersey to New Zealand. The world's largest shipping company went offline for a full week. And that meant, in practical terms, for people living their daily lives, household goods, food, components destined for factories were all stuck at the port. And the resulting chaos and delays caused over seven and a half billion pounds in economic damage. Now, of course, today, one of the most valuable cyber targets is the COVID vaccination supply chain. In July last year, we called out the Russian intelligence services for mounting cyber attacks on vaccine developers. It seems that almost nothing is off limits for these cyber criminals. As schools and universities prepared to restart face-to-face -face teaching in March, we found that around 80 different schools, colleges and universities were hit by ransomware attacks, forcing some to delay that return to the classroom. So that's why we're working to help organisations right across the UK, from the private sector to government to public sector, to protect themselves. And I'm going to come back to that point in a little, little while. But there's also a democratic dimension to the threats that we see because elections are now a prime target. Russian actors tried to interfere in the 2019 general election, spreading lies online, taking aim squarely at British democracy. And we've seen in the US presidential elections in 2016 and in 2020, multiple cyber attacks. Now let's try and put this in some kind of context in terms of the scale of what we're talking about. In the last year alone, the National Cyber Security Centre dealt with 723 major cyber security incidents. That's the highest figure we've seen since the NCSC was formed five years ago. In total last year, they stopped 700,000 online scams targeting the UK. Now, some of this activity is aimed at theft or extortion, but it all too often is simply focused on sabotage and disruption. And I think it's worth saying these actors are the industrial scale vandals of the 21st century. But that doesn't mean it's random. These hostile state actors, the criminal gangs, they want to undermine the very foundations of our democracy. And let's also be clear about it. When states like Russia have criminals or gangs operating from their territory, they can't just wave their hands and say nothing to do with them. Even if it's not directly linked to the state, they have a responsibility to prosecute those gangs and those individuals, not to shelter them. Now, these cyber attacks pose a very real risk and it's on a daily basis. The reason is because what they really want, what they're really aiming for, is to undermine our confidence in doing the simple things in life, whether it's checking a bank balance or paying for a food order online. So we've got to adapt to that threat, not just to, pretend, to protect and defend our financial interests, but to defend our way of life. Now, 
against that backdrop, let me set out three of the very practical, concrete ways in which we're upping our game. First, we're building up our domestic defences. Now, I'm particularly focused on this because, as Lindsay said, I'm chairing the cross-government ministerial group on cyber. We've already delivered a sustained program of investment through GCHQ, through the NCSC, to, to establish the UK as a global leader in cyber. We're expanding the NCSC's active cyber defence services. So, for example, we'll be taking down more and more malicious sites, helping the public sector to increase their email and website security. But we're not just reinforcing protection around the government. We want to help everyone, from businesses to families, to take the basic steps to stay safe online. Now, some of it's relatively simple stuff, but it may be simple, it's also absolutely essential to helping people to create stronger passwords, turning on two-factor authentication, updating our devices, backing up data. These are the basic bread and butter things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. And I have to say, I think the NCSC does a, a terrific job getting businesses to do this kind of basic due diligence, effectively helping them to defend themselves. They've helped over 23,000 companies in the last 12 months alone, and over a million companies access NCSC advice on staying safe online. Things like advice like giving boards the information that they may need to understand their cyber risk, right the way through to providing detailed technical advice for chief information security officers on how to configure their operating systems. And just yesterday, this conference heard about the NCSC's new early warning system, which will help alert businesses and other organisations to potential cyber attacks. So we're working to improve our resilience across government but also across society. And yesterday, the Queen's speech announced legislation to protect consumers from the harms associated with things like cyber attacks on smartphones, smart TVs, cameras and speakers. So there's a huge effort going into all of this. And I, and I would also want to say that uh, although it's a great and diverse uh, and uh, enormous scale of the threats that we're seeing, our approach is working, it is starting to pay off. We're getting better at detecting, disrupting, deterring our enemies. Acting with partners around the world, we name and shame the perpetrators. We did this last month with the SolarWinds attack, exposing the depth and the breadth of cyber activities conducted by Russia's intelligence service, the SVR. And by revealing the tools and the techniques that malicious cyber actors are using, we can help our citizens and our businesses to see the signs early on, and that will help them protect themselves from the threats. Now, I want to be clear not just about the scale of the threat, but the time period we're talking. This is going to be a marathon. It's a war of attrition. But we will keep relentlessly shining a light on these predatory activities. And that brings me to my second point. We're also building up our offensive cyber capabilities. We're not just going to sit back, guard against our attackers. We're going to target and impose costs on those who are taking aim at us. And so last year we established the National Cyber Force, bringing together defence and intelligence capabilities under one unified command for the first time. The NCF conducts targeted defensive cyber operations to support our national security priorities. Now, for obvious reasons, we don't talk much about our capabilities. But this kind of technology can prevent the internet from being used as a platform for serious crimes, for example, by denying access to a particular part of a criminal gang's infrastructure or undermining their network. We can use it in military operations. We did it in Iraq during the battle over Mosul to disrupt Daesh's battlefield communications, which helped coalition forces to take ISIL fighters by surprise. Then again in Syria, we used it to impair the ability of Daesh to produce and spread their poisonous propaganda. And so we'll continue to use these capabilities where necessary in a proportionate way and in line with international law. Because ultimately, the difference between us and our adversaries isn't just about our capabilities. It's about how we choose to use them. Here in the UK and amongst our like-minded partners, we insist on democratic oversight, democratic accountability. We demonstrate respect for domestic rule of law, but also international law. We use our capabilities because they're necessary to defend our citizens, to safeguard international collaboration as a force for good in the world. Whereas our adversaries use their cyber power to steal, to sabotage, and to ransack the international system. And that brings me to my third point, which is how we're working with our like-minded partners to make sure that the international order that governs cyber is fit for purpose. 
Now, our aim should be to create cyberspace that is free, open, peaceful and secure, and which benefits all countries and all people. We want to see international law respected in cyberspace just as we would anywhere else. And we need to show how the rules apply to these changes in technology, the changes in threats and the systematic attempts to render the internet a lawless space. Hostile states using cyber to warp a democratically held election, that violates international law. Governments and gangs using cyber to paralyze another country's healthcare system, that violates international law. So our challenge is to clarify how those rules apply, how they're enforced, and guard against authoritarian re regimes bending the principles to meet their own malicious ends. Now we've been at this a while. Ten years ago, the UK government brought together in London more than 60 countries to try and establish the principles for governing behaviour in cyberspace. Talking about basic principles, things like universal access to the internet, protecting individual human rights online. Now it's a good point of departure, but only a point of departure. But you've got to start somewhere. Today, as you'd expect, we're working very close with our traditional partners in the Five Eyes in NATO. But here, I think the key thing is, we're also seeking to bridge the old geopolitical dividing lines between the West and the G77, between the Global North and the Global South. So just to give you a flavour of it, last month, the UN General Assembly unanimously agreed a set of voluntary principles for how states should behave in cyberspace, including things like the importance of protecting health infrastructure. So that was another important stepping stone. But we want this to lead to a wider agreement on how to respond to those states who systematically commit malicious cyber attacks. Now here in London last week we had a good conversation about these kinds of issues at the G7 meeting of foreign ministers. And it wasn't just the usual G7 group. We invited ministers from India, Australia, South Korea, South Africa and Brunei, which is chairing ASEAN, to come and join us because we wanted to broaden the conversation, broaden the group of like-minded countries cooperating on cyber. Because we've got to win the hearts and minds across the world in a much broader space for our positive vision of a cyberspace, which is a free space open to all responsible users and there for the benefit of the whole world. And frankly, we've also got to prevent China, Russia and others from filling the multilateral vacuum. And that means doing a lot more to support the poorest and most vulnerable countries who are most at risk. So today I'm very pleased to announce that the UK government will invest £22 million in new funding to support cyber capacity building in those vulnerable countries, particularly in Africa and in the Indo-Pacific. Now that money is going to go to supporting national cyber response teams, advising on mass online safety awareness campaigns and collaborating with Interpol to set up a new cyber operations hub in Africa. The idea of that will be to improve cooperation on cyber investigations and to support those countries involved in mounting joint operations. So from my perspective, at least from a diplomatic point of view, is that as global Britain, we've got to be agile. We've got to work with traditional partners, but also with new partners. Now just take ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which I mentioned earlier. That's a good example. It's a leader in this field. There's the ASEAN Singapore Cyber Security Centre of Excellence, which is working to build up capacity across the region. Now that's a good example of the cooperation that we can really intensify, really energise, now that ASEAN leaders have signalled that they accept the UK's application to become a formal dialogue partner later on this year. So to sum all of this up, the threats we face from reckless cyber attacks like NotPetya or the attacks on our NHS, on our democracy, are all too real. But at the same time, I think we can feel confident, even optimistic, about the path that lies ahead. Because we can grasp the opportunities that the internet presents today and protect those at risk from the online predators. We can lead internationally in protecting the most vulnerable countries and at the same time bring together a wider coalition of countries to shape those international rules that serve the common good. And Britain has a real comparative advantage in this space. We've got the world-beating coders, the world-beating scientists, the groundbreaking innovators. And at the same time, we've also got in GCHQ, the NCSC, the National Cyber Force, the capacity to defend our liberties at home and to protect the world's online freedoms from those who would poison the well. And that's our mission as global Britain, to flourish as a tech superpower and to serve as an even stronger force for good in the world. Thank you very much.